hypotension, and perioperative myocardial injury. Patients undergoing surgery where they need general anesthesia now have little to fear from the procedure. Advancements during the last 25 years has made anesthesia safer. Deaths related to anesthesia during the 1990s occurred in two patients per 10,000 procedures. But today, that number has fallen to one anesthesia-related death per 200,000 to 300,000 procedures. According to the American Society of Anesthesiologists, a person is more likely to be struck by lightning than die from anesthesia-related complications. And because of great strides in modernization of monitoring devices, anesthetic equipment, and drugs, errors have become relatively uncommon. Anesthesia has now become one of the safest areas of healthcare today. Intraoperative anesthesia care has improved in leaps and bounds over the years. However, in striking contrast, studies have shown that 30-day postoperative mortality is 1 to 2 percent, and this number has only very slightly improved over the last decade. Postoperative mortality is thus about 1,000 times more common than anesthesia-related intraoperative mortality. If mortality within 30 days after surgery were considered a disease, it would be the third leading cause of death in the United States. About 4% of surgical inpatients over the age of 45 years will have a myocardial infarction meeting the American Heart Association's third universal definition. But 18% of these patients will have a rise in biomarkers of cardiac injury without symptoms nor evidence of ischemia on ECG. This group of patients are labeled as having myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery or MINS. The terms myocardial infarction and myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery need to be differentiated. Myocardial infarction is defined as a clinical or pathologic event in the setting of myocardial ischemia, in which there is evidence of myocardial injury. Myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery, or MINS, on the other hand, is a relatively new diagnosis, and it is defined as myocardial cell injury during the first 30 days after non-cardiac surgery. It includes both symptomatic and non-symptomatic MI, and it is independently associated with mortality. For this presentation, we will look closely at perioperative myocardial injury and examine the current available data describing its pathophysiology. Next, we will discuss the measures that we can take to prevent means in the preoperative and intraoperative settings. Finally, we will look into the postoperative care of patients who underwent non-cardiac surgery and see how we can detect and manage means. Let us first go on to discuss the pathophysiology of perioperative MI. MI can be recognized by clinical features, which include characteristic signs and symptoms, ECG findings, elevated biochemical markers of myocardial necrosis, imaging, or may be defined by pathology. These features constitute the classic definition of myocardial infarction. Through the years, as new data emerged from various international studies, the Global MI Task Force has redefined the term myocardial infarction. Particularly in 2012, introduction of a more sensitive assay for markers of myocardial necrosis called for a revision of the definition of MI, as well as classifying MI into five different clinical types. The introduction of high-sensitivity troponin assays in 2012 greatly enhanced the detection of myocardial infarction. These assays are able to detect much lower concentrations of the troponin protein, thereby allowing early identification of myocardial injury even before the onset of symptoms and classic ECG changes. The third global MI task force categorized acute myocardial infarction into five different types based on pathological, clinical, and prognostic differences. Type 1 is a spontaneous myocardial infarction. 
Type 2 is a myocardial infarction secondary to an ischemic imbalance. Type 3 is cardiac death due to MI when biomarker values are unavailable. And finally, types 4 and 5 are infarctions related to revascularization procedures. Of these types, type 1 and type 2 MI are thought to play the most significant role in the non-cardiac perioperative setting. Several small studies have been done to elucidate the etiology of MINS, but currently, its mechanism remains to be poorly delineated. These studies support that type 1 and type 2 MI may be important causes of MINS, and they have also agreed that MINS is likely caused by myocardial O2 supply and, and demand mismatch rather than from coronary artery plaque rupture and thrombosis. The term MI type 2 refers to conditions caused by ischemic imbalance. It is the presence of myocardial injury with necrosis, where a condition other than CAD contributes to an imbalance between myocardial oxygen supply and demand. Factors that determine myocardial oxygen demand include the patient's heart rate, contractility, and ventricular, and ventricular wall tension. Oxygen supply can be increased by increasing arterial oxygen content and increasing coronary blood flow. Atherosclerotic coronary lesions, vasospasm, and or endothelial dysfunction also have the potential to cause MI. It may also be due to the direct toxic effects of endogenous or exogenous high circulating catecholamine levels leading to a pure oxygen supply demand imbalance. MI type 1 or spontaneous myocardial infarction is an event related to atherosclerotic plaque rupture, ulceration, fissuring, erosion, or dissection with resulting intraluminal thrombus in one or more of the coronary arteries. This leads to a decreased myocardial blood flow or distal platelet emboli with ensuing myocardial necrosis. In most cases, the patient may have an underlying severe CAD. Knowing now the pathophysiology of perioperative MI, what measures can we do to prevent it in the preoperative and intraoperative settings? The first and crucial steps for prevention of myocardial injury after surgery are the identification of risk and its classification. Despite sophisticated technologies, history and physical examination of the patient still remain to be the key elements of preoperative risk assessment. Risk stratification of patients with known or at risk of CAD is usually based on three elements, and these include assessment of the patient's risk factors, functional capacity, and the risk factors of the patient. Patient surgery. The development of cardiac risk stratification indices began in 1977 when Goldman developed the original cardiac risk index. This index became a springboard for the development of newer indices, and two of these are endorsed by current guidelines. These are the Revised Cardiac Risk Index and the NSQIP MICA Risk Prediction Calculator, which was developed by the American College of Surgeons National Surgical Quality Improvement Program. The Revised Cardiac Risk Index features a multifactorial approach to assessing the cardiac risk of patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. It highlights six different independent predictors of major cardiac complications, and when the presence of risk factors is added up, a cumulative score will determine the patient's risk of developing a cardiac event. Major cardiac events are defined as death, MI, or cardiac arrest at 30 days post-op. The Revised Cardiac Risk Index is best used for patients at or above 45 years of age and also for patients between 18 to 44 years old who have significant cardiovascular disease. It can be used in the inpatient or outpatient preoperative setting, and it is well validated by multiple studies and large systematic reviews. Some disadvantages to the use of this index are that its use is still not validated among patients undergoing emergency surgery and other, risk, other patients' outcomes are not assessed by this tool, including the risk of stroke, major bleeding, prolonged hospitalization, and ICU admission. 
Another risk stratification index that is endorsed by current guidelines is the NSQIP MICA risk prediction rule, which was developed to, the, to guide surgical decision making and informed consent. This risk calculator, which is available online, uses 20 different patient predictors such as age, ASA class, BMI, presence of hypertension, and others, as well as the planned procedure to predict the chance that patients will have an adverse outcome within 30 days following surgery. It is able to predict many different patient outcomes, including serious complications due to myocardial infarction. Preoperative testing is another aspect of preoperative patient preparation. Pre-op diagnostic testing is aimed at answering precise questions raised by clinical history and examination. As a rule, no cardiovascular test should be performed if the results will not change the perioperative management. Performing pre-op diagnostic tests may lead to the optimization of medical treatment, modification of the surgical procedure, adjustment of the anesthetic management, and a better evaluation of the risk-benefit ratio of a procedure. It is important to note that no single test will ever exist to fully stratify all risks because perioperative cardiac events are multifactorial in cause. Preoperative screening for coronary artery disease is one of the controversial topics in the preparation of patients about to undergo non-cardiac surgery. Coronary angiography is an invasive procedure which carries a mortality of 0.01 to 0.05% and a morbidity of 0.03 to 0.25%. It is indicated only in cases of unstable coronary syndromes of uncertain stress tests in high-risk patients undergoing major surgery or when there is a possible indication for coronary revascularization. Regarding pre-op coroangio, according to the ACC AHA Task Force in 1993, when CAD is diffused in small vessels, or when the patient is not a candidate for revascularization because of comorbid states, coronary angiography has little impact, as the probability of the results leading to percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty or coronary artery bypass grafting is very low. Angiography should therefore be performed before a non-cardiac operation only in high-risk patients who may warrant coronary revascularization for medical reasons irrespective of the preoperative context. With regards to the role of preoperative coro and CT angio in prognostication, a study done by Sheth and colleagues in 2015 showed that CT angiography can improve the estimation of risk for patients who will experience perioperative cardiovascular death or myocardial infarction. But the findings are more than five times as likely to lead to an inappropriate overestimation of risk among patients who will not experience these outcomes. How about pre-op coronary artery revascularization? Is there a benefit to offering it to patients with CAD who are about to undergo non-cardiac surgery? McFalls and colleagues in 2004 conducted a multi-center randomized trial involving 510 patients with stable coronary artery disease who underwent elective major vascular surgery. The principal finding of this study is that among patients with stable coronary artery disease, coronary artery revascularization before elective major vascular surgery does not improve long-term survival. Therefore, on the basis of this data, a strategy of revascularization before elective vascular surgery among patients with stable cardiac symptoms cannot be recommended. The use of perioperative medications to prevent myocardial injury have been studied, but the results are disappointing. The perioperative administration of beta blockers has been a topic of debate for many years. A recent meta-analysis showed that the novo beta blockade started within one day of surgery did decrease PMI, but at a cost of higher rates of stroke and death. The AHA and ESA suggest the continuation of beta blockers in patients already receiving it. Initiation of beta blockers for high-risk surgery in patients with clinical risk factors or myocardial ischemia may be considered. 
however, not without preoperative titration and not on the day of surgery. In the perioperative ischemic evaluation 2 or the POIS2 trial, perioperative aspirin did not decrease death or non-fatal myocardial infarction, but rather increased major bleeding. The AHA guidelines state that the continuation of aspirin for non-urgent, non-cardiac surgery may be reasonable in patients without prior coronary stenting if the increased risk of cardiac events outweighs the increased risk of bleeding. The POIS2 trial also examined the effect of clonidine to reduce sympathetic activation during surgery. It was found that clonidine did not reduce non-fatal MI, but did increase clinically relevant hypotension and non-fatal cardiac arrest. The alpha-2 agonists, therefore, are not recommended for the prevention of cardiac events. Statins have been found to decrease perioperative major adverse cardiac events and mortality. In a large observational study of the vision data last 2016, patients receiving statins preoperatively were shown to have a significantly lower risk of all-cause mortality than a matched population. The ESA and AHA guidelines recommend continuing statins. They also consider their initiation reasonable in both patients undergoing vascular surgery as well as in patients with a clinical risk factor scheduled for high-risk procedures it is recommended to start statins two weeks prior to surgery. There are no exact intraoperative and or postoperative measures known to reduce the incidence of MINS, and much still remains to be studied. What we do know currently is that there is evidence to support that intraop blood pressure optimization is beneficial. There is also some evidence showing that higher transfusion thresholds for RBCs do not affect mortality in the short or long term. An association between intraoperative hypotension and mortality has been discussed in a number of recent observational studies. Van Ways and colleagues in 2016 examined almost 900 vascular patients and showed that a 40% decrease of pre-induction MAP over more than 30 cumulative minutes was associated with post-operative myocardial injury. The baseline map used in calculating the relative change was defined as the mean map of all available BP measurements in the operating room before induction of anesthesia. The cumulative duration of hypotension was calculated and defined as the total number of minutes that the map was below the threshold during the surgical procedure. The primary outcome noted was post-operative myocardial injury defined as an increased cardiac troponin within three days after surgery. In an analysis of adult patients having non-cardiac surgery at the Cleveland Clinic, a full third of all hypotension occurred between anesthetic induction and surgical incision. Furthermore, hypotensive minutes were significantly and comparably associated with both myocardial and kidney injury before and after incision. Hypotension before incision is most likely resulted from anesthetic induction drugs and occasionally from patient positioning. These causes are recognized to be largely preventable. In terms of BP control, how strict or how liberal should we be when managing intraoperative hypotension? Futier and colleagues in 2017 conducted a study to, to answer this question. High-risk patients were randomized into two groups, a minimal blood pressure control group that received ephedrine for systolic pressures less than 80 or 40% below baseline, and a tight BP control group that received a norepinephrine infusion to maintain systolic pressure within 10% of baseline values during and for four hours after surgery. The primary outcome of this study was the occurrence of a composite of SIRS and or at least one organ damage by day seven after surgery. Results revealed that among those who received tight BP control, 56 out of 147 patients developed SIRS and at least one organ failure occurred. While in the minimal BP control group, 75 out of 145 patients developed it. 
The investigators also reported that in the tight BP control group, there were fewer cases of sepsis and the duration of hospitalization was shorter. This study therefore supports the use of targeted and individualized systolic pressure monitoring management to reduce the risk of post-operative organ dysfunction. In terms of intraoperative heart rate and correlation with means, a study by Abbott in 2017 reported that prolonged heart rate of more than 100 beats per minute in combination with a systolic BP of less than 100 is associated with an increased risk of means. They also showed that the lowest intraoperative heart rate of 55 and the highest systolic pressure of 160 was associated with means. Finally, with regards to blood transfusion, two studies by Carson in 2011 and 2015 compared a liberal transfusion strategy with a restrictive strategy. They found that liberal transfusion did not reduce rates of death, inability to walk independently on 60-day follow-up, or reduce in-hospital morbidity in elderly patients at high cardiovascular risk. A liberal transfusion strategy involved transfusion of packed RBCs once the patient hemoglobin has reached 10 grams per deciliter, whereas a restrictive strategy involves transfusion once the patient presented with symptoms or at a physician's discretion for a hemoglobin level of less than 8 grams per deciliter. The findings of Carson suggest that it is reasonable to withhold transfusion in patients who have undergone surgery in the absence of symptoms of anemia or a decline in the hemoglobin level below 8 grams per deciliter, even in elderly patients with underlying cardiovascular disease or risk factors. We now move on to the prevention of myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery. The complexity of perioperative mechanisms contributing to myocardial injury makes the diagnosis and treatment of MINS quite challenging. Post-operative strategies proposed to prevent MINS include more frequent or continuous vital signs monitoring, avoidance of hypoxemia, correction of contributing factors, and intravascular volume optimization. Despite its compelling logic, a high-quality data showing an improvement in hard outcomes through monitoring is inconclusive at best. Measurement of troponin levels using high-sensitivity troponin T is central to the diagnosis of MINS. It is noted that majority of MINS occurs within the first two days after the surgery. Ideally, troponin measurement should flag at-risk patients, should be validated in prospective studies examining hard outcomes, exhibit incremental value, be of clinical utility, and improve clinical outcomes. However, all this has yet to be proven in the context of the treatment of MINS. This uncertainty with regards to modification of clinical outcomes has resulted in a debate on the utility of routine perioperative screening. Screening for MINS is recommended in the high-risk group and it is defined as patients who underwent in-hospital surgery with one or more additional risk factors from the revised cardiac risk score. It also includes patients more than 65 years of age or patients with known atherosclerotic disease. Expert recommendation for screening states that highly sensitive troponin should be measured in high-risk patients two to three days after major surgery. It should be obtained at 6 to 12 hours post-surgery and on days 1, 2, and 3 after surgery. In addition, some experts obtain a baseline preoperative cardiac troponin in high-risk patients since an isolated elevated post-operative troponin may represent an acro a chronic process rather than an acute event. Some experts have suggested that somewhat lower-risk patients, such as those with risk factors for cardiovascular disease, undergo screening given the worst short- and long-term outcomes associated with perioperative MI. The AHA guidelines state that the usefulness of post-operative troponin screening among these patients without signs and symptoms of ischemia is uncertain, as defined management strategies are lacking. 
They only recommend measuring troponin when signs or symptoms suggestive of ischemia or infarction are present. This approach has been criticized as it suggests that the utility of troponin screening is only established in symptomatic patients. The consensus now is that low-risk groups should not be routinely screened. A large international cohort study done by BOTO in 2014 attempted to establish diagnostic criteria, characteristics, predictors, and 30-day outcomes of means. They determined that the optimal diagnostic criterion for means is a peak troponin T of 0.03 nanograms per ml or greater and is deemed due to myocardial ischemia. As for the use of 12 lead ECG in the screening for means, patients with symptoms of MI should get at least one 12 lead ECG. However, the issue of when to obtain a screening ECG in asymptomatic patients is not yet well studied. The evidence to support routine performance of post-operative ECG in high-risk patients to screen for means is weak compared to the use of troponin. At present, there is limited data regarding the screening, diagnosis, and treatment of MINS. But because MINS can entail a poor prognosis among surgical patients, Mauerman and colleagues in 2016 published a management algorithm for MINS based on evidence that is available. They suggested that screening should be done among admitted patients who are considered high risk, those who are age 65 and above, those who are age 45 and above with a history of coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, and cerebral vascular disease. High sensitivity troponin T is requested prior to surgery and on the first two post-operative days. Patients with an increase in high sensitivity troponin T of at least 14 nanograms per liter should receive a cardiology consultation. Assessment of the pathophysiology of the patient's myocardial injury is then to be evaluated if it is either a type 1 MI or a type 2 MI. Based on the suspected type of myocardial ischemia, individual patient comorbidities and bleeding risks, the patient may either receive aspirin, a statin, and potentially a coronary angiography, or an optimization of oxygen supply and demand, a statin, and or the recommendation for outpatient cardiac ischemic workup. It is also recommended to initiate aspirin as soon as possible, independent of thrombosis prophylaxis. However, this should be weighed against the risk of major bleeding. Finally, means should be managed with an interdisciplinary approach and in close collaboration with the surgeons, anesthesiologists, cardiologists, and other treating physicians. To summarize what we have discussed, evidence for the exact pathophysiologic mechanism of perioperative MI is still largely unknown but is most likely due to supply-demand mismatch and to a lesser extent coronary thrombosis. Prevention of MINS involves identification of the patient's risk factors using the revised cardiac risk system or the NSQIP MICA risk prediction calculator. Preoperative coronary and CT angiography should not be routinely performed before non cardiac surgery in patients with known stable CAD. Preoperative coronary artery revascularization does not improve long term survival among patients with stable CAD who are about to undergo non cardiac surgery. In terms of preoperative medications, beta blockers should be continued in patients who are already receiving them. Aspirin has no perioperative benefit in decreasing the risk for MI. Clonidine administration does not reduce occurrence of MI, but increases the risk of hypotension and non-fatal cardiac arrest. And statin should be continued perioperatively. A 40% decrease of pre-induction MAP for more than 30 cumulative minutes is associated with post-operative myocardial injury. Most episodes of intraoperative hypotension occur between anesthetic induction and surgical incision. It is likely due to induction drugs and patient positioning. Tachycardia in combination with a systolic BP below 100 is associated with an increased risk of MINS. 
bradycardia and hypertension are also associated with means. In the absence of symptoms of anemia or decline in hemoglobin levels below 8 grams per deciliter, it is reasonable to withhold blood transfusion. Screening for MINS should be done for high-risk inpatients using high-sensitivity troponin T assays prior to surgery on another first two days post-op. Depending on the perceived pathophysiology of MI in the patient, a therapeutic regimen of aspirin, statins, coronary intervention, and optimization of oxygen supply and demand should be initiated. An interdisciplinary approach to management and treatment is also recommended. With that, thank you very much and good afternoon to all.